Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering Edge 2016. Brought to you by IBM. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome to Las Vegas, everybody. This is theCUBE, the worldwide leader in live tech coverage. And this is our special presentation, our fifth year at IBM Edge. IBM Edge started in Orlando as a pretty boutique storage show, you know, maybe a thousand, couple thousand people, and it's uh, grown into an, uh, an overall systems, IBM systems business event, uh, hosted by Tom Rosamilia, who's the senior vice president of the systems division, which now comprises mainframe Z, power, open power, and storage. Um, under Ginny Rometty's uh, guidance and leadership, IBM has restructured its hardware business, as you know, sold off its x86 business along with its BNT networking business. And what's left is the remnants of IBM's massive hardware business, which is a business that is in a sort of flat or managed decline uh, with a, an agenda to actually grow. How is IBM planning on doing that? Well, Stu Miniman and I are going to be talking about that uh, all week here, actually today and tomorrow, wall-to-wall -wall coverage of IBM Edge. Stu, two weeks in a row, it's always a pleasure working with you. We were at the Riverbed event last week. Uh, our colleagues are out at uh, Oracle Open World, and uh, it's good to be with you again. Great to be with you, Dave. Uh, back here in Vegas yet again. Uh, you know, you, it's been a little while since you've been here. I was here for VMworld uh, a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, this is a real interesting show. It's my fourth year doing the show. Um, and I love how, seeing how IBM takes some of these assets and integrating it to the rest of the portfolio. So things like power and mainframe, well, it's a lot about how Linux fits into those, how they fit into the cloud, how data and analytics, uh, things like Watson and cognitive computing, uh, tie into these underlying infrastructure pieces. So, Lots to dig in, some really cool uh, you know, users that they have uh, you know, in the keynote, and a lot of them we're going to have on theCUBE. Really excited to have like the MIT Technology Review, you know, Red Bull Racing, uh, you know, lot, lot, lots of great use cases uh, that, that we'll dig into to talk about what's going on. So concomitant with this event, we've launched a, a new uh, site, ibmgo.com is the digital experience for Edge and five other IBM events, including World of Watson, which is coming up in October, but check that out so you'll see the IBM Kino channel, you see the Cube channel, obviously the Cube content is open and, and uh, no login required. Some of the IBM content is, is premium, but check that out. Um, and Stu, let's talk a little, little bit about what's going on in the marketplace. So we know IBM has sort of pivoted, uh, it's, it's sort of delevered its lower margin x86 business, kind of complete opposite of what HPE and Dell are doing. Dell and HPE are surviving in a lower margin business. IBM, under again, the guidance of Ginny Rometty has decided you know, the, the margin is of course in software and services and cloud, and it's really, it's, it's shed its lower margin x86 and, and some of its networking business. That's completely transformed the way in which people view IBM, partner with IBM, and how IBM goes to market. Um, so, from a storage standpoint, it's, it's all about flash, it's all about software defined, and keeping the portfolio alive. From the standpoint of Z, it's about making Z open, and from Power's perspective, you know, Power started off with five partners, Open Power rather, and then IBM has really been aggressive under the guidance of Tom Rosamilia of driving Power partnerships, got I think 250 now, not, not the least of which is China. And you did a tweet the other day which I thought was very interesting. You said, what's the bigger threat to legacy hardware vendors, AWS or China? 70% of the respondents said AWS, which is kind of obvious, everybody knows AWS is you know, kicking butt and growing very, very quickly. But China is interesting. Why China, Stu? Why do you see China as a threat to the legacy hardware vendors. Yeah, so, so Dave, one of the most interesting things, you and I talked about it uh, from our studio a, a week or so ago, um, is you know, look at the, the, the latest top 500. Uh, the, biggest super, the, mo the fastest supercomputer out there is made with Chinese chips. So China you know, couldn't get the latest and greatest Intel chips, so you know, they, they made their own chips. We understand what China's doing in networking, in compute, uh, expect to see China doing more in storage. So you know, of course they've got their own in-house kind of captured market, that they always want to you know, buy China, uh, but you know, where are they going to expand their growth? Uh, the U.S. has pretty much blocked uh, you know, a lot of those China-made products from getting into uh, the U.S. market, but uh, you know, we, we think there's a real threat there. Uh, I guess you know, <laughs> it's a threat to the U.S. economy uh, from those standpoints. Some of the manufacturers and makers of you know, innovative technology is you know, how much will China you know, 
copy what they're doing? How much will China just go beyond what they're doing? Well, open power is a fundamental lever there because I, 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 China wants to be self-sufficient and will be, you know, presumably by the end of the decade, it's going to have its own ships based on power and perhaps other you know, technology. Uh, it's got a, its own version of Linux. There's a Cloudera of China. There's a Wikibon of China. That's just sort of the, the way in which Ch China operates. So that's very interesting. But here's what's, to me, interesting from IBM's perspective. So one might think, wow, what's IBM doing? It's giving up its intellectual property to the world. IBM recognized that the expense, the R&D expense of competing with the likes of Intel, and of course, I guess, to a certain extent, Oracle, uh, is very, very expensive. The way to do that and continue to innovate is to open up the platform, take the source code and make it available uh, to the world. IBM's taking a play out of its Linux playbook, in my view. It realizes that the money isn't necessarily in the chips and in the hardware, but the money is on the software on top of that. IBM has made many, many billions and huge, huge profits in the Linux business, and it was really the first to popularize Linux into you know, the mainstream. And it did that by saying, we're going to invest a billion dollars in Linux, and it successfully moderated Microsoft's monopoly. It's taking a similar approach. You heard Tom Rosamilia talk about how Moore's Law has, has hit. You really don't see faster clock speeds anymore. How are they uh, achieving you know, faster speeds? It's with layering on more cores. And so people are doing sort of unnatural acts now to keep Moore's Law going. IBM figures, hey, let's open that up to the ecosystem, allow the ecosystem to drive innovation, and we will lay our software on top of that, bringing those innovations into our hardware systems, our cognitive systems, our analytic systems, AI. So a lot of the innovations that are floating on top of the IBM hardware, and IBM obviously from a hardware standpoint will have hooks into that. The other piece of it is IBM for years has had a global services organization which is a captive channel for its own hardware products. That's how it's been able to successfully fund innovation in its hardware despite the fact that it's not necessarily a you know, number one or number two player in all the markets. It's taking a, a, a similar strategy with cloud. Cloud is a huge channel for IBM, isn't it? Yeah, I, absolutely, Dave. And while this is an infrastructure show, we, we keep hearing IBM, how is it pushing up the stack? How is it getting into the application layer? Uh, it's, it's in the open source, it's why they've got companies like Red Hat and Hortonworks up on stage there. Now, not like Dell and Hewlett Packard Enterprise don't also partner uh, with, with, with Red Hat and Hortonworks, but you know, IBM has had a long legacy of how they, they deal with open source. Uh, you know, all, all of their different platforms are, are, are supporting Linux, um, and and uh, th that's a foundational layer for everything that they're doing in the infrastructure. And from a cloud standpoint, right, you, you know, IBM, makes good revenue in cloud. Uh, I wouldn't say that they are quite in the same uh, you know, category as an Amazon or a Microsoft. Or, well, they're not. Uh, but right? th th mean, they're not, but uh, you know, th th they are um, you know, a good layer there. Um, you know, when we were... A good keep, layer, as in a soft layer. Yeah, yeah, they, they, they've <laughs> got soft layer, they've got Bluemix. Um, you know, VMware uh, made IBM the first partner for the, uh, the vCloud Air network uh, that they had. So, you know, IBM understands the enterprise, they understand how to leverage open source, um, and when we say, how are you going to live in the future when you know, infrastructure is being commoditized in general, uh, you know, IBM has a good story as to how they you know, are going to create innovation uh, and push uh, you know, new solutions in the marketplace. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. So here, here are Dell and HPE jettisoning its, their higher margin software business. HPE just sold off its software business for $2.5 billion in cash and HP shareholder ownership and 15.1% of this new MicroFocus uh, 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 portfolio, which comprises HP software division. So let's get out of software, essentially. HP will say we're not getting out of software, but essentially they're getting out of any software that doesn't run hardware. So they're still in the open view business. Okay, mm -hmm. great, check. Dell has sold off, you know, under the uh, uh, guidance of uh, Tom Joyce, a uh, friend of theCUBE, it's uh, many pieces of its software division. Yeah, the old, the old Quest stuff. The and old Quest stuff, and they're keeping Boomi, right? So, okay, right. so they're keeping some of the higher margin business, but there's some security stuff gone or going. Uh, so Dell embracing lower margin hardware, taking on, you know, willing to take on ODMs in China. Uh, with, and account now, of course, with EMC and the, and, the, and the distribution channel that EMC has, broadening its supply chain. HPE going after, embracing some of those lower margin business. IBM not. IBM running away, not walking, running from low margin business, much in the same way that Oracle ran away from the low end x86 business that Sun used to have, moving up the stack, realizing that software, cognitive, AI, cloud, machine learning, analytics, 
that's where IBM plans on making its margins. So it, it doesn't have to, we've talked a lot about the need to compete as an infrastructure player with Amazon volumes, unless you have a unique advantage, which IBM does, obviously Oracle does, uh, but EMC and HPE are arms dealers, you know, to the cloud, yeah. whereas IBM has a captive cloud channel and can get those higher margins, uh, bringing its hardware onto the soft layer cloud. And we heard Matt Cadu, who's coming on theCUBE later on, talk about their stack, which essentially involved a lot of different pieces, including Aspera. Uh, we heard Tom Rosamilia talking about Ustream today. Ustream is what we've been using for years to power the CUBE platform. IBM acquired that. We heard him talk about Cleversafe, a, uh, a, a move that IBM made to basically compete with S3. So here's IBM bringing all these services into the cloud uh, and focusing on a hybrid strategy for both on-prem and off-prem or public cloud. So bringing the, the, the story to cloud, um, what's your take on IBM's overall cloud strategy? You summarized it before, but let's dig a little deeper into it. How does it stack up relative to the competition? Yeah, so, so Dave, I, I think you nailed it. The, the proper compare for IBM really is Oracle today. Um, you know, as, as they build their stack, uh, you know, IBM is, uh, you know, I, I'd say more open uh, than Oracle is. Doesn't mean that Oracle's not doing some open source out there, but you know, Oracle builds the red stack. You know, here's our hardware, um, you know, it's, it, Built, built on Sun, all the way up through the database. Uh, you know, IBM, you know, Open Power, you know, Z, a, a great interview I remember last year from this show, uh, interviewed Walmart, uh, and uh, you know, I saw Walmart at two big shows that I went to. One was here at Edge uh, last year and talked about, you know, Global Z Linux. So, you know, you think about a company you know, that has kind of the global reach of Walmart and, you know, ZOS, you know, globally distributed as a major piece of how they built their infrastructure. The other show they were at was OpenStack. So, you know, obviously, you know, Walmart, you know, values open source and needs to build a lot of their infrastructures. They're not going to do it on AWS, and IBM's a strong partner for them uh, on that. So, you know, IBM, you know, builds all the stack with a lot of openness built in uh, and stacks up well against what Oracle's doing. Um, but, you know, both IBM and Oracle, uh, they have their own clouds. Unlike you said, HPE and Dell, uh, which are going to be uh, the suppliers to people like Microsoft for Azure and all of their service providers out there. Um, so you know, very different paths they've had. Uh, you know, very much uh, focused on you know the application and moving up the stack for IBM. So I want to talk about some organizational uh, action going on at IBM. Um, Ed Walsh was brought in a couple months ago to run the storage division. Now the storage division at IBM has been a revolving door of executives. Um, a variety, a number of people, Ambush Goyal, who was you know, sort of one of the architects of IBM's software and analytics business, ran storage for a while. Jamie Thomas, who's now running strategy for Rosamilia, ran storage for a while. She's sort of uh, a, Tivoli, you know, like a, a Tivoli sort of person that understands the software business. She came in for a while, helped architect IBM's move into software-defined storage. Ed Walsh is someone who used to work at IBM. We all know Ed Walsh as a startup um, maven. Uh, an, an individual who's really expert at uh, uh, taking struggling companies, shoring them up, repositioning them, re-strategizing, flipping them. Um, he sold Avamar to EMC, uh, he sold Virtual Iron to Oracle, he sold Storewise to IBM, did a stint at IBM, went off and got his MBA at MIT at the Sloan School, uh, then did Catalogic, left Catalogic, and IBM you know, was able to lure him back. They made an offer, I guess, that he couldn't refuse. A lot of people have speculated, oh, they're bringing Ed in to sell the division. Um, I will ask him, I'm sure he won't comment on that. I'm not so sure, I think Ed Walsh, with his new you know, MBA credentials, would like to you know, be an IBM executive for a while, turn the division around. He's a storage guy, one of the few storage people that has you know, been in this business you know, run this business. Andy Monshaw, before you know the ones I mentioned, really wasn't a storage guy, even though he did the XIV deal and obviously learned a lot. But they were the, the people who ran the IBM storage division were more rising stars within IBM, where the storage GM was a stepping stone. Um, maybe it was like, hey, you know, we need an exec to shore this business up. You go do it for a while and then move on. So you saw a lot of that shuffling. Ed's a storage guy, so we're going to see him. I think in that position for a while. The thing I wanted to bring you to, into is partnerships. Under Rosamilia, Tom Rosamilia, the senior vice president of the division, they've, IBM has really made a big push into partnerships. By jettisoning and, and selling its x86 business to Lenovo, that has opened up some huge opportunities 
uh, for IBM. Uh, it now, first of all, can compete more aggressively with Intel. It also, as part of that deal, sold off its BNT networking division. Mm -hmm. So now it's got, you know, there's two-edged sword there. One, it's got the, the no handcuffs now on, on, on partnerships. At the same time, the whole world is moving toward hyperconverged and they just sold off their networking division. So that means they have to partner for networking. And you've seen with VersaStack, IBM and Cisco getting a lot more friendly. You know Cisco really well. What's going on with Cisco generally and IBM Cisco well, specifically? Well, Dave, yeah, not just the networking, we'll get to that in a second, but if I'm going to build a hyperconverged solution, what's IBM going to do? They're either going to have to partner with somebody like Cisco or are they going to run it on power? All the hyperconverged solutions today are built on kind of standard Intel processors, you know, Nutanix, VMware vSAN, you know, EMC ScaleIO, SimpliVity, uh, all those guys are, you know, pull the storage into, you know, my Intel box. So well, it needs it needs partners for IBM that. doesn't have an Intel box anymore, and are they, after they've jettisoned that, and they're pushing to soft layer, and they're pushing this, I wonder if they're just going to seed this part of the market, um, because you know, we've been talking to IBM for years, and you know, there's, it seems to be that they would have a hyper-converged solution as part of their storage portfolio. They've done great in Flash. Uh, you know, they, they've, they've got a number of pieces uh, there. They understand software-defined storage, um, but Maybe they just offer the software and, and they partner uh, for the hardware, as you said. And, and right, if, they've got, if they manage the hardware piece from the compute, if they own the software piece, either through an acquisition uh, or something in-house, uh, you know, networking is something that we're hearing more and more uh, that you need to understand. If it's a very small configuration, it's not a challenge. But as you scale, uh, networking can be, uh, you know, is something that breaks in the environment and something that they need to have. Uh, it's something we've heard, you know, the, the, what used to be VCE, now the EMC Converged Platform Division, uh, feels that they have down solidly, mostly through their partnership uh, of, of Cisco. Um, Nutanix, uh, you know, I've talked to plenty of Nutanix customers that scale quite well, um, and you know, you just get people in there that understand networking to fix that, um, but you know, right, IBM, it doesn't have hyperconverged yet, and they don't have the networking piece, and that means you know maybe they need to rely on Cisco more, uh, which which could be a little dangerous. Cisco's trying to go right into the hyperconverged market themselves. Uh, they've got their OEM solution called Hyperflex, um, which and is a Spring you know, Path. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, a spring, IP. It, it, it's an OEM that they have uh, brought in through Spring Path, uh, and you know how are they going to fit in the mix? Cisco's done great in partnering with all the big guys, you know IBM, Hitachi, EMC, and NetApp on converged. But for hyperconverged, all these guys are going through some churn and fighting each other a little bit as to you know, who owns the hardware, who owns the software, who owns account control. Uh, definitely something we've been watching closely for the last few years. Well, it's going to be interesting to see. So, so maybe IBM looks at, at you know, networking, core networking is non-strategic. It might look at it as a lower margin business and or it doesn't want to take, Cis take on Cisco's 66% you know, market share. And maybe it's trying to leapfrog. So some historical context here. Back when, years ago, when Bill Zeitler, this is over a decade ago, ran the IBM Systems and Technology Division, it was called at the time, he made a statement that, that the, business, the, rev, the business is growing at 6% and R&D is growing at 9%, something's got to give. And one of the things that gave, and you've heard me talk about this before, is storage investment. So Bill Zeitler was a server guy and he said, I'm going to invest in the server business and I'm going to, I'm going to OEM a lot of the storage stuff. So it was LSI, and it was, it was Milex, and it was you know, all kinds of, of, of third party activity. It was bringing in IBM servers to be the IP of the, comp the compute portion of the storage. Remember, all storage runs on microprocessors. Uh, and so they really j ratcheted down the R&D in storage. Well, you know what happens when that happens. <laughs> when that happens, your storage falls behind, and then you got to play catch up. Andy Monshaw bought XIV that, because they saw a, an opportunity in virtualization. They had to fill a gap. They had to compete with the likes of 3PAR and Compellent and all those guys, so they brought in XIV. Good little acquisition for them. Made a couple of other tuck-in acquisitions, but IBM and storage is, uh, IBM invented storage. I mean, it was the monster gorilla in storage for decades. But what happened was when EMC came in and knocked IBM off the top, you know, top block, IBM had to play catch up, and IBM has consistently struggled in taking R&D and bringing it into product pipeline in storage, and that's one of the things that uh, we're going to ask Ed Walsh about, see if they can, you know, have, have been addressing that problem. Jamie Thomas addressed that through a software-defined storage strategy. What I'm getting to, Stu, is maybe IBM says, you know what, this hyper-converged play is a, is a, is a chase that, that we're not going to be able to catch up, because we're the tortoise, that's the hare, so maybe what we need to do is a leapfrog that with a, with a true software-defined strategy, through partnerships and with our own you know, power strategy 
and, and go into you know, more of a server sand type of mode, mm -hmm. like what Datrium's trying to do, like what Eguaz is trying to do. Maybe there's an acquisition uh, for some of those guys. Remember, IBM is very, very good at acquisitions. It's just not been able to translate, translate necessarily that acquisition prowess into the storage business. It's made some good acquisitions, but it's, it's not hit the type of home runs that it has with, for instance, a Cognos or its SaaS platforms that it's had over the years. So maybe IBM is thinking about a leapfrog strategy with regard to hyperconverged. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's really interesting. So if you think back to the, the, the server side of things, you know, IBM Blade servers were the highest performance in the marketplace, and when virtualization came, IBM was there, but Cisco, when they came out with, the, it was the Project California, their UCS, Cisco passed them and really ate their lunch. And rather than try to fight back against that, IBM shed the x86 and focused on power. And if, if I remember right, the, the, the data that David Foyer's put out on you know, power, what Oracle's doing with, with the latest generation of their chips, uh, has higher performance than, than anything on the x86 side. Uh, so you know, not following down the same kind of leapfrog that everybody else is doing, but you know, using other resources and, you know, as you said, trying to leapfrog uh, what, what's happening there. So it's interesting, absolutely. Uh, software is the real driver uh, in, in storage these days, uh, yeah, IBM understands what they're doing with cloud, they've got open source, they've got lots of partnerships, so there's more than one way to skin this cat uh, of the storage uh, transformation. Yeah, and IBM, um, with its pure systems, made an attempt at converged infrastructure. I, I think, generally speaking, it's, you would agree, it's not was not a home run. No. Right? I mean, IBM, they made a run for it, they had great, great messaging. Steve Mills, I was there when they announced it, and I said, wow, these guys really nailed it. They're attacking the IT labor problem, but they weren't ever able to execute on the, on the, the product and the go-to-market. And then when they sold off the x86 division, that sort of threw everything up, up in the air. So, you know, I'm concerned about over-rotation into server sand. I mean, we love server sand. We've put out these long-term forecasts. By the end of the decade, you're going to start to see the sand market really start to get eaten into, that's at least what we're saying. We'll see whether we're right or whether the IDC forecasts of up and to the right you know, you know, are correct, we'll see. Um, but I think I'm concerned about companies over-rotating. That's why I like the startups that are, that, are, that are doing this. We mentioned a couple before, and maybe IBM's just sort of sitting back and saying, let's partner to fill the gap and, and let's watch what's happening. You know, the big issue here is can IBM you know, continue to drive innovation and drive growth uh, to support its overall company strategy of cognitant, cognitive, analytics, and so forth. And that really is the fundamental strategy of what IBM's trying to do, is support the digital transformations that are going on with infrastructure for the future. It's got a lot of good use cases. Uh, we've got some folks from in the insurance business. We've got some, you know, the CIO from Red Bull Racing coming on. IBM and Edge always has, all IBM shows, always have great customers, really good use cases, cases excellent executives, a strong women in tech presence. Of course, it's you know CEO of one of the largest tech companies on the planet is is a woman. So that's you know high marks for IBM uh, on that. Always really really good content. Yeah, I'll I'll give you last thoughts on the opening segment and uh, what do you think? Yeah, so, so, so just to close out on the server sand piece, mm -hmm. one thing to look at, it's not just about the direct replacement for kind of storage that we have today, uh, it is some of the transformational things. So if I can build infrastructure that SaaS can live on, that might not be in my data center, my customer might, might not be buying it, so that's where things like Bluemix uh, and Watson and all the analytics plays that IBM has, so they might look at the overall market, where it's growing, where they're going to be fighting for margin, and deciding which ones they want to play and, and, and which ones they don't. That's like the, the CleverSafe acquisition, is there's a storage play, but there's very much a cloud play. Uh, so, you know, IBM looks, at, there's the whole 3D chess going out there in the marketplace, uh, lots going on there, and as, as we said, you know, infrastructure, um, you know, is, you know, interesting, but it's the foundational layer to enable everything above the stack. Well, you know what, let me, let's, let's stay on this for a minute. I think yeah. we got time, right? We yeah. got some time. So, okay, let's, 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 let's stay on this because under Gerstner, IBM made the choice of getting out of some lower margin business like spinning disk. They sold that division off to Hitachi. They sold, you know, later on, they sold the microelectronics division. They actually, I think actually paid somebody to take it. It's like the Red Sox getting rid of a bad player. And, uh, but, but, but it really shores up the balance sheet, it cleans up you know, the income statement. And so my point is that IBM is using a lot of its old plays that worked well, Bluemix, you can, you can relate to the, the WebSphere success. Cloud is today's version of services, it's just cloud, it's services at scale, at repeatability, 
uh, but it's, it's a captive business. The difference is bringing in a lot more partnerships through technology, although IBM Global Services, I'm sure, installed many, many uh, uh, EMC disk drive over the years, so they would do that if the customer wanted. If the customer didn't care, then they would just integrate you know, their own products. So you're seeing that play. IBM's billion dollar bets, the Steve Mills billion dollar bet in Linux, you've seen that in a number of, of areas, software defined, uh, Flash, I'm not sure Flash was ever announced at a billion, actually Flash was announced at a, at a billion, Spark, they never announced a billion, but I'm sure it was many hundreds of millions that they're investing in Spark. So you're seeing that IBM place its bets in a big way as it has done in the past, and it's, and it's worked really, really well for the company. So you're seeing this very large company slowly turn and now aim for the future. And I think you're going to start seeing, we've been saying this now for years, <laughs> been sort of waiting for this to happen, but IBM's to start really clicking on all cylinders, certainly from a financial standpoint, and it's been, been buying time with things like stock buybacks and dividends and so forth, and that's worked for the company. Um, now it's all about on to the future, which is cloud, uh, certainly analytics and big data. IBM really doesn't use the big data term, but certainly analytics, cognitive. IBM is, is way ahead of most enterprise players in cognitive. Maybe not ahead of Google and Amazon and, and Apple, but, but they're with them and, and applying it with their deep, deep industry expertise. So, you know, the future, I think, is, is bright, uh, but still a lot of questions remain, Stu. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, you know, one of your favorite things to talk about, Dave, is the marginal economics here. Is IBM still too big to be successful in you know, some of these challenges going forward? There needs to be that shift from services, which is very much throwing people at it, to software where you can gain that scale, um, and that's where you, you, you mentioned some of, the, some of the big software players. I mean, even people like you know, Facebook, Salesforce, and the like are really starting to get into uh, the, that kind of cognitive and artificial intelligence space, um, and you know, can IBM's Watson, you know, uh, be a big enough player there to be able to grow there? And how much, you know, how many people do they need for that compared to traditional IBM Global Services, which has been, you know, uh, you know, such a big piece of IBM's business for so long? Well, SoftLayer is the platform for that, and Bluemix is the secret sauce uh, to to bring together IBM's disparate uh, software business because it is a very <laughs> fragmented, stovepiped software business. Uh, that IBM brought in through many, many acquisitions, dozens and dozens of acquisitions over time. But so Bluemix is that, is that secret sauce to bring all those things together. But you're really starting to see the IBM strategy come into focus. Cloud, uh, cognitive, you know, scale, uh, uh, jettisoning low margin businesses, leveraging its deep industry expertise. So Ginny, remember, ran strategy before she became CEO, so she's got a pretty good handle on all this stuff. All right, Stu. Uh, that's a wrap of our intro. We are going wall-to-wall -wall coverage of IBM Edge. Of course, you know our colleagues are across the way in uh, in, uh, in 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 Moscone at uh, Oracle Open World. John Furrier and uh, Peter Burris are there. We'll be covering Edge live Monday and Tuesday. Wall-to-wall -wall coverage. Keep it right there, everybody. Check out IBMGo.com for all the IBM main tent sessions, general sessions, and keynotes. And uh, and also you'll see the Cube channel there as well. And tons and tons and tons of great contact great content coming, flowing in from SiliconANGLE, flowing in from Wikibon, fl flowing in from third parties as well. Keep right there, everybody, this is theCUBE. We'll be right back. <laughs>